السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد We start in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high the one to whom belongs all praise the one upon whom we rely the one who gives and the one who takes and the one to whom we return Glorified and exalted is he. And we send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his family and his followers until the end of time. I believe that much of the community perhaps this week, or at least I hope that much of the community this week is heavy hearted. And we should be heavy hearted for a number of reasons. Uh, the most prominent of which right now at the forefront is the accident that befell our greater community and our specific community as well earlier this week, wherein we lost two of our brothers, Nozad and Abdurrahman, and three also young women who were with them at the time. So we say, لا يصيبنا إلا ما كتب الله لنا, that nothing befalls us except that Allah has written it for us. And we say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Verily, we are to Allah and to Him we return. And we remind ourselves that, Man kana yarju liqa Allahi fa inna ajan Allahi la'at. And for the one who hopes in their meeting with Allah, then verily their meeting time with Allah is coming. And everything has an ajal, everything has a time, and we do not know when that time may be. And one of the younger brothers, I was speaking to him last night, and he told me, he said, you know, Sheikh, I've heard you say so many times, over and over again, that you don't know when you're going to die. And I always thought to myself, he said, no offense, but I always thought to myself, I'm 15 years old, what is he talking about? I don't need to start praying now. I can start praying when I'm 25. I can start praying when I'm 30. I have a lot of time left. And he used to say it and he used to tell the stories and all of it would just go in and it would be there somewhere but it wasn't really affecting me. I thought it was all just exaggerations. But now it's very real. And one of the questions that is coming to mind that, that is repeating itself is, why does Allah take the people that we love away from us? And actually, as is commonly the case with many questions that repeat themselves, is that the question itself is actually wrong. And the question itself is wrong because the question indicates that those people actually belong to us. And that's why we're told to say in times of hardship, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, that we belong to Allah and to Him we return, because we actually belong to Him. So when you say, why was this person taken from me? It's actually an incorrect assessment of the situation, because the person did not belong to you in the first place. The person belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each and every single one of us is the creation of Allah, and Allah has put us here for a limited time. And in that limited time, we have a responsibility to live righteously as much as possible. And to do what we can while we're here and make the best of it, but it's not our life in the first place. Now, this is something that we have to keep in mind and something that we have to remember. And we also have to keep in mind the verse that came before, that the one who, rem who hopes and seeks for the return to Allah, then Allah loves to meet them. So when we see deaths that occur around us in the community, people who we love, people who are close to us, this is a fact of life, that people die. And sometimes they're close and sometimes they're far. But no matter where they are, it's always a reminder. It's a reminder as to the reality of life 
And it's a reminder to try and set ourselves straight in many ways. And the thing that always comes to mind for me is the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. When it was time for his life to end, and he knows that he's Khalil Allah. He knows he is the close friend of Allah. So when the angel comes to take his life, the angel tells him that it's time for your life to end. And Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, would Allah like to take the life of his Khalil, his close friend and companion? And the response of the angel to Ibrahim alayhi salam was, does not the Khalil want to meet his Khalil? Does not the one who is the close companion of Allah want to meet his close companion? So Ibrahim alayhi salam was then satisfied with the end of his life. So these type of things are reminders. And as much as they're reminders about death and the reality of life, they're also reminders about how we as a community function. And this is something that has been boiling in my chest all week. And I've really done, I think, alhamdulillah, a very good job to control it. And I'm going to try to be as nice as possible. But I want everyone to understand that our priorities, in most cases, are completely off. And it's reminiscent of the story of Ibn Umar radiallahu an, who was in the Haram. And a group of people from Iraq came to him shortly after the death of the Hussein and the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when they were killed in, in, in Iraq. And this group came to Ibn Umar radiallahu an, and they asked him, is it permissible for us while we are in Ihram, while we are in this state of sanctity, to kill mosquitoes? And Ibn Umar, he started laughing at these people. He told them, they're asking about killing mosquitoes when the family of the Prophet ﷺ was just slaughtered in their midst. Meaning their priorities are completely out of whack. And as such, there's some things that we need to think about as a community. As a community, the lives of human beings are a priority. As a community, the religion of people is a priority. If people are driven out of Masajid for the silliest of reasons, there's one brother who's here today, he told me a story that happened to him last week in this masjid, alhamdulillah, alladhi ab'adni an masjid fi dhalik al waqt. All praises due to Allah who took me away from the masjid at the time when this happened. That the brother gave the adhan and someone came to him and they told him, brother, jazakallah khair, your adhan was very nice, but your clothes is a C and my clothes is an A. Because my clothes is the sunnah, meaning I'm wearing Eastern clothes, somehow that became the Sunnah. And your clothes is Western clothes, so it's a C. It's absolute nonsense. First of all, it has very, very minor and small foundation in the teachings of Islam in the first place. But second of all, it's completely out of place. Completely out of place. And then you have kids, for example, we get complaints all the time. You think I like kids to come to the masjid and their aura is showing? I don't like it. People get mad at me, they tell me, Imam, tell them to fix their awrah, tell them to cover this, tell them to do that. You think I want them? I tell them, I meet them at the door, I say, Salaamu Alaikum. Jazakallah khair, brother, can you pull your shorts up a little bit? That way your knees are showing. I want to see your thighs during Salat. This is not something that I do. Sister, can you, when you come to the masjid, can you take off your hijab? I'm not the one doing that. I'm not the one telling them what to wear. But we don't understand the reality. Either we're closing our eyes to it, or we don't understand it. I go to some MSAs locally. I've been to MSAs where sisters attend MSA with short shorts on. People are leaving Islam. People are addicted to drugs. People are doing all types of things. And when they come to the masjid, we tell them, brother, fix your clothes. Before we even figure out their name, before we figure out who they are, before we figure out their history, before we figure out anything else, we're telling them to fix their clothes. It's not to say that we shouldn't have etiquettes in the place of worship, but it's to say that our relationships with human beings should precede those etiquettes. That the relationship is more important. Sometimes a very important wisdom is that sometimes you lose the argument, but you win the person's heart. And sometimes you win the argument and you lose their heart. Many times you have the truth, it doesn't matter. If you are not able to bring the truth to the heart of that person, they're gonna remain misguided. They're going to remain in problems. I mentioned this after Salat one night. Statistics of Muslims in America who are in college, 46% of Muslim American college students say that they have drink alcohol in the last 30 days. 46%. 
So where are the priorities as a community? What are we thinking about? So I have some messages to the parents and some messages to the youth, inshallah, and then some messages to everyone, just for the sake of equality. So to the parents first is, or to the adults, number one, why is it that we always return to our staple silly debates? Why? Either you have some level of knowledge of Islam and you understand where the disagreement exists and where it doesn't exist and where there's flexibility and where there's not, or you don't. I'm sorry to make this very clear. I myself went through many stages in my life where I thought I knew what I was talking about and I realized later on that I had no idea. And many times I thought, okay, there's one opinion on this issue because everybody told me that there is one opinion on it. For example, reading Qur'an for someone after they die. This came up yesterday with a brother. I told him, actually the majority opinion is that it's permissible and that they receive the reward of the Qur'an when it's recited for them when they die. And he said, really? I said, yeah, I was shocked too when I figured it out because everyone told me that there's one opinion. There's not one opinion. We have a lot of issues as a community. If we're going to focus on one opinion on every single issue, those kids and everyone else is going to stay where they are because we're putting our priorities in the wrong place. We're going to go back to arguing over Tarawih. We're going to go back to arguing over Arabs versus Desis. We're going to go back to arguing over any number of issues that come up that repeat themselves over and over again and should have died 20 years ago if we had any sort of scholarship on the ground. We have to move on. So that's number one. Are we going to go back to these things? These things are really not a priority. Make a decision and move on. Number two, we need to recognize the real issues of the youth. Usually what happens, I'll give you an example in this case. The accident occurs, you talk to an adult, they say, if people can move in, Jazakallah khair. You talk to an adult and they say, well, they were speeding, right? This is wrong on so many levels. Yes, they were speeding. Most likely, this is what the police report says, and it seems that that's probable. But that's not the point. Number one, when you say they were speeding, right, you're doing two things at the same time. The first thing that you're doing is you're taking away their humanity. You're writing off their death as something that was justifiable and expected, and they got what they deserved. In internally, that's what you're doing. The second thing that you're doing is you're turning your head away from the issue. Instead of asking, why were they in the situation that they were in? Why did they make the decisions that they made? Why did this brother live across the street from the masjid and we do not know who he is? That's a real question, is it not? That's the question that's plaguing me for the last week. Why does he live across the street from the masjid and we don't know who he is unless the brothers, except for the brothers and maybe sisters that went to high school with him? We have to answer these questions. We have to understand the real issues. There's serious, serious issues of depression amongst the youth. Serious, serious issues of thoughts of suicide amongst the youth. Serious, serious issues of gender relations and uh, obscenity in gender relations. Serious issues of bullying. Serious issues that are related to mental health and spiritual health. Turning your head away from them and blaming your children and telling them that it's their fault and they're weird and they're this and they're that is not going to help the situation. It's not just going to disappear on its own. It's not going to, they come to you, they, they actually come up with the courage to speak to their parents who they usually feel that they can't speak to. And they tell them, mom or dad, this is my issue, I'm really struggling with this. And they tell them, stop being a fool. Suck it up. What's wrong with you? Don't you know this? Don't you know that? You think that's helping the situation? Chances are the child is going to go into the bathroom and start eating pills. This is very serious. It's not something to be taken lightly. There's also issues of self-harm, cutting. Young women who are cutting themselves out of the pain and depression that they're feeling in their lives, there are major issues. And unless, we're begin, unless we have the courage to stand up to those issues, Islam will continue to have a very limited role and message in the lives of the people around us. We have to have the courage to carry that message. Number three is that we need to get serious about parenting. Over and over again, I'm getting very interesting discussions and conversations and stories about the kind of parenting that is occurring. I don't know. I mean, maybe I grew up in a home that was actually very good, and I grew up watching The Cosby Show, and that was a different generation. But the stories are just ridiculous. And I'm sorry to say, if you are carrying out your internal issues, mental health issues, spiritual issues, imbalances that you might have internally onto your family. Don't come to the masjid afterwards and complain 
that your kids are astray. The first place that your kids are learning anything about Islam is in your home. And if you're not bringing that to them in a solid and understandable way, with rules that make sense, and an understanding of Islam that makes sense, then don't be surprised when they're rebelling. Because it hasn't made sense to them. So these are my reminders to the parents. To the youth, number one, take care of yourselves, please. What we have, what Allah has given us, our bodies have multiple components and our bodies are a responsibility from Allah. Take care of your body. Don't drive recklessly. It's a very silly thing. You know, I always, I have a theory. I haven't proved it. If someone wants to take it up psychologically, that the way that someone drives is a very solid indicator of their personality. <laughs> you get in the car with someone, you can understand the way that they, they, they think, the way that they function, their behavior pattern by the way that they drive. Usually young people, they're in a lot of turmoil, so they drive a little bit crazy. Don't do that. I did it when I was young, it's a mistake, it's not cool. All these things are not cool. It's not cool to drive crazy, it's not cool to speed, it's not cool to put your life and the life of others in danger. It's not cool to do drugs, it's not cool to do alcohol, it's not cool to hook up with girls, it's not cool to hook up with guys. You have more worth than that. Watch what you put into your body, watch the way that you live your life, watch what you put into your mind. It's very important. The music that you're listening to, the TV shows that you're watching, all of these things are going into your head. And they're affecting the way that you think. And unless we're able to build a critical capacity about what goes into our minds, we're not going to be able to have a critical understanding of the world around us. So always be in the pursuit of knowledge and beware of your minds. Even in my days of jahiliyyah, in my days of ignorance, I, never, I didn't touch marijuana. My number one reason is because I didn't want to mess up my brain. Because it's very serious. It's not cool. When you go, and I knew people, I had friends. You talk to them, you can tell that these people have smoked too much weed. Because they're slow. And a lot of times it's irreversible. You can tell when someone's been doing meth. Because they have this little twitch to them. And they don't even realize it sometimes. So we have to beware of what we put into our bodies. And the third is for the youth, beware of what you put into your heart. A lot of our young brothers and sisters are in relationships that they shouldn't be in. And they're giving their hearts to people that they shouldn't be giving them to. And what happens is that doesn't work out because it never works out when you're 15. I hate to break it to you. Unless you're one in a million, it's not working out when you're 15 or you're 16. And what you put into your heart is going to affect you later on because now your heart is broken. Now you hate yourself. Now you're beat down. You can't go and face the world and everything else. If you've made mistakes, the mercy of Allah is near. All you have to do is ask for it. And all you have to do is turn back to Him. It's not a difficult process. It's not some self-mutilation. It's not some sort of self-hate, some, some hatred towards your, yourself and your own life and your experiences. You just do it. You turn back to Allah and that's all there is to it. The second thing to the youth is that we need to open our hearts to one another. And basically that means we need to stop the gossiping. We need to stop the bullying. We need to stop the hatred that we harbor towards one another, and we need to actually connect. We need to be there for each other, and we need to love each other. And this is the example of the Prophet ﷺ, who was the most beloved of people to everybody around him. And all of the people that he interacted with, they thought that he loved them more than anyone else. That's the way of the Prophet ﷺ. The third point is to remember that there are bigger things in life than your Facebook page, you know, some, this issue of cyberbullying came up recently, and I didn't understand. I mean, like, just make your account private. Or don't go on accounts that are public. Or disengage from the things that are around you. It's, I know it feels overwhelming, but just disengage. You can do it. You can do it. And to, the world is bigger than Facebook. The world is bigger than your high school classroom. The world is bigger than the money that you're going to make when you graduate. Your responsibility in life is bigger than that. To the older people amongst the young folks, it's time to embrace manhood and womanhood and move on. You're out of college now. You're no longer an MSA. You're working. You're going to have a family. You're going to have kids. You need a community where you're going to raise that family. And we need you to give back to that community. Because without that demographic, we're never going to move forward. The demographic of people that are born and raised here, they finish school, they're working, they're establishing their families, and they're getting set in their life, and they understand their Islam, and they understand the society that they're in. We need you. 
and we need you to embrace growing up. And that means being here for one another and going through the hardships that occur as a result of it. In the end, in the second half, inshallah, I'll talk about some advices to everyone. Most uh, importantly, as a reminder to everyone else, is that we need to follow the sunnah of telling those that we love that we love them. And one thing that I appreciate about my parents is that as we were growing up, although we didn't have any religion, it was common practice that you do not leave the home, you do not end a phone conversation without saying, I love you. It just doesn't happen, no matter how mad you are. Even if you are mad to the point that you're leaving the house and I'm going out and I can't take it anymore and I don't want to hear it and so and so, you leave the house and as you're closing the door, you say, I love you. Because it was drilled into our brains that you don't know. You don't know. You might go out that door and you might die. Or you might go out that door and your mother might die. Or your father might die. And you will have left the home that day without telling them that you love them. And you will live the rest of your life regretting that you didn't tell them that you love them. And the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, as he said, is that if you love somebody, then you tell them that you love them. This is the sunnah. Sometimes we're so tough, we're so, we're so hard that we can't tell people that we love them. And if we're going to actually love one another, we have to be able to say it. Sometimes we need to hear it. So, um, before I go into the end part then, I would like to say that I love all of you for the sake of Allah. Although sometimes you give me a headache. <laughs> and sometimes I'm up late at night thinking about the problems of the community. And sometimes I can't even read anymore because... There's so many things going on and I have a new baby at home and I'm sitting there with the new baby yesterday and thinking, man, what am I going to do about the khutbah tomorrow? <laughs> but I still love you. And that's actually the real nature of love. The real nature of love is not this joke that we see on TV or that we see in movies or that people fantasize about. That's not how love is. Love is hard. Love is painful. And love takes struggle. And that's why the message of Islam is a message of love. And why the Prophet them spread love everywhere that he went. So this experience uh, that we are going through as a community is a tragedy and it is a hardship. And our prayers are with the families of those who have passed away. And we ask Allah to forgive uh, our brothers who passed away. Ameen. One of the janazas is after the Juma prayer at Garden Grove today. I'm not giving the second khutbah. Our brother Kareem Sayyid will be giving the khutbah because I'm going afterwards to the janazah, inshallah, and the burial. I would encourage others to do so as well. And the Prophet wasallam told us to, that when you pray on the body, you get the reward of a mountain of Uhud in charity. And if you follow the janazah, you get the reward of the mountain of Uhud in charity. So it's a very big reward because it reminds us of reality. There's a common misconception that women cannot go to the graveyard. There's a difference of opinion. Some scholars allowed women to go to the graveyard for the burials on the condition that they can control themselves. If you're going to go to the graveyard and start screaming and hitting yourself and things like this, then it's better for you to stay at home. But if you are in line with our culture in America, which is that you do not act crazy at graveyards, then it's permissible for you to go to the graveyard and follow the burial as well. But this is the condition, so keep that in mind. We should take these times of hardship as times to come together as a community. Sometimes we think that we need sophisticated programming and planning and we need the most cutting edge things. We don't really need that. What we really need more than anything else is to come into this place to worship Allah and come into this place as a community and come into this place with love and brotherhood and support and companionship and give to one another just as we give to the world around us. This is what we have to do. And if we can do that, we will build strong relationships and we will build the resilience that we need to face the difficulties around us. We need love and we need support. And if we can't get that in the house of Allah, then 
I'm very pessimistic as to where we're going to get that, and especially for our young folks, where they're going to get that. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. O oh Allah, you are the merciful, you are the generous. Forgive us of our sins, accept from us our deeds, help us to remain steadfast. Forgive our brother Abdul Rahman and our brother Nozad who have passed away. Enter them into paradise and forgive them of their sins and their shortcomings. Give their families patience and the families of all the deceased patients. O oh Allah, help our brothers and sisters who are struggling all over the world. Increase us in knowledge that benefits us and benefit us from that which you have taught us. Enter us into paradise and keep us away from your punishment. And help us to follow the example of your messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ghfir lana dhunubana wa israfina fi amrina wa thabbit aqdamana. Allahumma barik fina wa baynana wa alif baina qulubina wa wahid sufufina. Allahumma kun ma'ana wa la takun alayna. Allahumma kun ma'ana wa la takun alayna. Allahumma alayka bi dhalimin al-taagheen. Allahumma ansur ikhwanana al-mustadha'afina fi kulli makan. Allahumma ansur ikhwanana al-mustadha'afina fi kulli makan. Allahumma ighfir li ikhwayna abdul rahman wa nawzir. Allahumma ighfir lahum ya rabbil alameen. Ighfir lahum ya rabbil alameen. Allahumma taqabba minna wa afu anna wa آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وأقيم الصلاة